Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutors Star Course Series, where regardless of where you live, you probably have an eye on the weather right now. If you're in Portland or Seattle, you're getting ready for 100 degree temperatures. If you're in the Southeast, it's almost hurricane season. If you're here in sunny California, like I am, fire season has already started. Fortunately, we have the world's foremost expert on weather, at least on violent stormy weather, uh, Storm Chaser Reed Timmer here today, who's going to tell us all about why that happens, why crazy weather is happening, where it does, when it does, and, and how we can be ready for it and really appreciate it as you know, just such an amazing uh, piece of nature. Now, we also have some special guests here I want to introduce you to everybody. We've got our Weather Wonders campers here at Varsity Tutors. Weather Wonders crew, you guys want to say hello? All right. The Weather Wonders crew here, that's actually, if you are out there wondering how you get involved in Weather Wonders Camp, there's a link on your screen. Uh, it'll be a prize as uh, I give you guys your instructions for uh, a little bit later on in class. couple things before I turn it over to Reed. One, we're going to keep this really interactive. You see the Weather Wonders campers have been uh, doing some interaction with Reed even before class, and it's a blast. Make sure you use the chat box to the right of the screen. If you have any questions for Reed, type those in toward the end of class. I'm going to interview him with your questions to get some answers. Answers. He's also going to ask you some questions to find out what you know about weather, what you like about weather, and what the weather's been like in your neck of the woods. And so answer his questions in that chat box too. Also have a camera nearby. In about a half an hour, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen, get a picture with Reed. And if you upload that to Instagram, you'll be entered to win uh, an entry in Weather Wonders Camp. So you can join uh, all those lovely faces that uh, you saw on screen just a minute ago. So have that camera nearby. With all that said, uh, I've got the forecast for the next 45 minutes and it calls for a whole lot of fun. So let me introduce you to your teacher for today, Storm Chaser Reed Timmer. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Why of Weather class. And uh, I'm right in the heart of storm chasing season right now. I was just chasing some tornadoes near the Montana, North Dakota border uh, here just recently. And um, now uh, it looks like there could be a severe weather setup as well uh, tomorrow, uh, just to the Northeast, uh, Northeastern Kansas, looks like out uh, near Kansas City as well. And, uh, but we're not only gonna discuss storms and storm chasing, we're gonna discuss why uh, the storms happen in the central United States and nowhere else. We're also gonna discuss some of the rainiest locations in the US. We're gonna discuss why the wind blows, not only in tornadoes and hurricanes, uh, but in general in the tropics as well, those trade winds, the easterly trade winds that go across uh, the belt there uh, near the equator. And uh, we have a lot to talk about today, including those locations that uh, historically have the worst uh, weather as well. And uh, we're also gonna discuss uh, why tornadoes happen in Tornado Alley and maybe shifting a little bit to parts of the Mid-South uh, given climate change. Uh, but I really look forward uh, to uh, teaching you about the basics of weather uh, the whys of weather, as we call it, with a little bit of a storm chasing twist as well. I'm going to show you videos from inside hurricanes as well. Uh, section two is going to be the why of wind, why the wind blows. Section three is going to be where that good and bad weather happens across uh, the United States and the world. And we're going to discuss why that happens. And then we're going to discuss those wild weather words that you hear meteorologists use so often, like bomb cyclone, polar vortex, for example, uh, nor'easter, uh, those types of words we're also going to discuss. But first I wanna ask uh, you guys a question. What is your ideal weather? I know it's different for everybody. My ideal weather is actually tornadoes and supercell storms. I feel most comfortable around uh, those big time supercells. I know that they leave a dark side uh, back behind them. That is the damage that those storms leave, but that's what we're trying to prevent as storm chasers and meteorologists to issue those warnings so people can take shelter inside. But what is your ideal weather? See some great answers coming in right now. I'm sure a lot of people love sunny weather as well, but your weather actually happens in the very lowest layer of the atmosphere. That's the weather that we experience every day, uh, whether it's great weather, whether it's bad weather, uh, we experience that in what's called the troposphere. And if you can envision the atmosphere almost like an onion, it has different layers throughout of it. You consider it uh, as a layer cake, except that it's a perfect sphere. And every single one of those layers has different characteristics that will happen. But the troposphere is the lowest layer in the atmosphere. And that's the weather that we experience every day when we look out the window uh, even the highest level clouds 
uh, for the most part, are located in the upper por portion of the troposphere, those very high level clouds. But there are very rare clouds that happen very high up in the atmosphere, about 75 to 80 kilometers above uh, the surface of the Earth. And those are called noctilucent clouds. And you can see an example of those in the bottom right. My friend up in Canada took those with a very special camera late at night. But those beautiful glowing clouds actually happen 80 kilometers uh, up above the atmosphere. Uh, that's in the mesosphere uh, up high up in the atmosphere. But the second layer up above the troposphere, that's called the stratosphere. Uh, that's often where planes will fly. That's also where the ozone layer uh, is located. You may have heard a lot about that as it contributes to warming uh, in the atmosphere in an ozone hole uh, located over Antarctica. I know that was uh, very big when I was uh, younger, but the ozone layer actually absorbs UV radiation from the sun. And that's why the stratosphere actually warms up as you go up above the troposphere. But above the troposphere and the stratosphere, uh, weather is relatively quiet there. Uh, there uh, are a couple of uh, animals that actually will fly up in the stratosphere. A swan is an example. Cranes will also fly up there in the stratosphere up above about 20 kilometers above the ground. Above that, we call the mesosphere. And the very uh, furthest out uh, portion of the atmosphere is called the thermosphere. And that warms up once again. And uh, that's uh, consisting of, of, of ionized uh, particles up there that are ionized by the incoming solar radiation that ion, uh, electrons and atoms uh, up there are, are ionized in the thermosphere. And that's why it warms up once again. And then you slowly uh, head up into space uh, where you lose that atmosphere. But it's the atmosphere here around the earth uh, that also keeps us alive. We uh, can breathe uh, uh, and it's composed of uh, uh, largely oxygen and nitrogen. Uh, oxygen allows us to breathe and respirate in the troposphere, uh, but that's where our crazy weather happens. You can see that cumulonimbus cloud in the troposphere as well. That's where tornadoes happen. That's also where hurricanes happen. So whether your ideal weather is tornadoes, thunderstorms, nice weather, maybe fog, cloudy, humid, uh, that all happens in the troposphere uh, here right at ground level. Uh, that's the lowest level uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. And the Earth is heated un unequally. That's a, a large reason of why we experience the weather that we see, why we experience wind as well. And uh, you can see that diagram uh, that I produced on the bottom right. Basically, you have greater heat, uh, greater solar radiation at the equator, a minimum at the poles. So it's heated unevenly. The tropics are a lot warmer than the poles that stay very cold. Uh, you get a, a relatively cold, uh, uh, extremely cold. The polar vortex uh, will uh, encapsulate uh, both of the poles. And that's when you get those big Arctic air masses in the winter when you get a buckling of that jet stream. Uh, but in the tropics, uh, generally speaking, uh, the weather is relatively quiet compared to the mid-latitudes, the exception being uh, those easterly tropical cyclones, such as hurricanes uh, that happen in this hemisphere. They're called typhoons on the other hemisphere. But you can see that those trade winds that are located near the equator, north and south throughout the subtropics, those are easterly winds, north and south of the equator. And those are largely driven by those circulations, the uneven heating of the equator and the poles. And because the Earth is also spinning, it causes wind to be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and causes it to be deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere. And that leads to these vertical cells uh, that will also uh, transport heat. But the whole entire goal uh, of these winds is basically to transport heat from the equator to the poles and also from the surface and aloft in the atmosphere. And the storms that we see also contribute to that heat transfer, as do the, uh, the currents in the oceans as well. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean across the planet. The Atlantic is also a very large ocean. The Gulf Stream, for example, that uh, stretches from south to north on the western edge of that basin, that is critical in transport heat from the equator uh, to the poles and with climate change, uh, change as the earth is trapping a lot more of that heat with time that's creating a disruption in some of these patterns and that's why we're seeing a shift in tornadoes from tornado alley to portions of the mid-south but the tornadoes and supercell storms that we see they happen in that belt of westerlies in the mid-latitudes uh, that's also where the polar front jet stream happens as well. And uh, that creates a lot of wind shear, the strongest temperature gradients as you go from warm uh, to cold from south to north through the mid-latitudes. That's where some of that, uh, the, the worst weather happens there as well. And then uh, to the north of that jet stream is where all that cold air, cold, dense air, uh, cold air weighs more than warm air and it, uh, generally wants to slide underneath the warm air. So that's why those outbreaks of air masses that come from the poles toward the equator will act to slide underneath that warm air. 
And those boundaries between those different air masses are called fronts. And that's where the really crazy weather will happen. And now we're going to move on to air masses. So air moves in discrete uh, pockets that are quite large as well. And those air masses will have a similar personality depending on where they come from. Uh, you can see the dark blue air mass there in northern North America, also over portions of northern Asia there and covering the entire portion of Antarctica. Those are the coldest air masses that are located over land areas. Land uh, will tend to cool at night a lot faster uh, than water because water has a lot higher of a specific heat capacity. Uh, so it takes a lot longer for water, especially large oceans, uh, large bodies of water to cool or to warm up. So the very coldest air masses are located in the interior uh, land portion of the continents. And uh, we basically uh, have six different types of air masses. We have continental polar. Those are those dark blue ones uh, that are uh, near the poles. Those are the coldest of the air masses. We have continental tropical uh, as well. We have maritime polar, maritime tropical as well. Continental tropical are the hottest of the air masses. Those originate at lower latitudes where the sun is out more often in the interior of those continents. You can see the red area there, uh, one of which is in northern Mexico into the southwestern U.S. Uh, folks that live down there know that it's been extremely hot uh, so far this summer. Locations like Death Valley, uh, Central Southern Arizona as well, Phoenix. I know you've been in the triple digits for a long time. Even here in Colorado, we've been in the triple digits. And that's because of a northward migration of that continental tropical uh, air mass, which are the warmest ones. Those are red. Uh, also covering northern Africa there across the Sahara. Uh, those are the hottest air masses, but also the driest. And then the maritime air masses, maritime polar, maritime tropical, those are infused with moisture, cloud cover, rainfall. Uh, but the maritime tropical are those warm, humid air masses that will come into the southern US during the summer. And uh, that last uh, map that I showed you with the different uh, circulations and global circulation patterns, that changes as well according to the seasonal cycle. So everything will shift a little bit north in the northern hemisphere summer. It'll shift back to the south in the northern hemisphere winter. Uh, but here you can see that these air masses move uh, generally from north to south during the winter. Those continental polar air masses will invade the northern U.S. We call those a polar vortex. Uh, outbreak when uh, a piece of that polar vortex breaks off and slides into the US. That's when we get the bitter cold, the big time lake effect snow, thunder snow downwind of the Great Lakes. One time I was covering a big lake effect event in Buffalo, New York, that had over nine feet of snow over a four day period. There was thunder snow. The snow was piling up so dramatically that you just couldn't drive. I actually had to go on foot. Uh, some people had to make snow caves there to survive, uh, but those continental polar air masses stream from north to south during the winter. And then when you get those very warm outbreaks uh, coming in from the south, that's usually maritime tropical air masses streaming in from south to north. So for example, the severe weather event that I'm chasing tomorrow, that's a big storm system that's coming in, a collision of air masses, a continental air mass and also a maritime tropical air mass pumping that moisture northward. And where those two air masses meet, you can get extremely volatile weather. And that's where it looks like there is a chance of tornadoes tomorrow across northeastern Kansas and northern uh, Missouri. Uh, that's because of those merger of the two air masses, a maritime tropical and a continental polar air mass. And you also get very hot, dry conditions behind what's called a dry line. Uh, that's for those infusions of the continental tropical air mass from the Mexican plateau. And basically the collision of all those air masses over the central US and Tornado Alley is why we get some of the strongest supercell storms and tornadoes anywhere else in the world. And the boundary between those air masses is called a front. So a cold front is when uh, a continental polar air mass is surging from north to south uh, through the country. A lot of times they happen in the, in, the, in the fall as well. You'll get what's called a blue norther, a very cold, dense air mass, which weighs more than the warm air, will slide underneath that warm air. And it's a lot of times blocked uh, by the Rocky Mountains to the west that will surge from north to south. And you can get temperatures plummeting from the triple digits all the way to freezing. Uh, I was documenting a blue norther in eastern Colorado uh, where they happen quite a bit uh, near Denver. And uh, that was a massive cold front that came through. It was a dry cold frontal passage as well. Sometimes these cold fronts and fronts can be associated with stormy conditions very often. Cumulonimbus clouds, those are the clouds that uh, produce the very large hailstones that I intercept, those tornadoes as well. But you can see that cold air sliding in underneath the warm air. That's a cold front. And when the warm air overtakes that cold air, slowly eroding it, sliding over top that cold air, 
that's called a warm front. And that's when you have an air mass, like a maritime tropical air mass that's displacing a continental air mass. Those warm fronts can also uh, be a zone of increased tornado potential. I'm actually targeting a warm front tomorrow in uh, northeastern Kansas. It's going to lift up to northeastern Kansas, northern Missouri. Uh, those are often associated with tornadoes as well because you get very strong wind shear along those boundaries. You also get converging winds along fronts. So when cold fronts move from north to south, you have cold northerly winds back behind them. Out ahead of that cold front, you have very warm southerly winds. And those converging winds cause lift at the ground level. And when that lift happens, that develops clouds, develops storms, supercell storms as well. That's what's happening in northern Nebraska today. Massive supercell storms or cumulonimbus clouds that are rotating are producing very large hail up there. And that's along a cold front uh, that's moving from north to south this time of year. But usually storm season shifts a little bit north because those maritime tropical air masses and continental tropical air masses are dominating amongst, amongst the, uh, over the uh, polar air masses that are located further north, well to the north in Canada this time of year. And that's our section on air masses and the global circulation patterns. And we've discussed wind quite a bit. There you can see a video uh, from Hurricane Michael. Uh, that was a category five hurricane that impacted the Florida Panhandle a couple of years ago. The strongest of hurricanes, one of the strongest ever to impact the US next to uh, hurricanes like Hurricane Andrew as well. And uh, those are category five winds that we experienced in Panama City Beach there in the Florida Panhandle. Uh, but we talk a lot about wind. Tornadoes are also uh, the strongest winds on the planet located at ground level. Uh, there's also a very windy place uh, called Mount Washington there in northern New Hampshire. And sometimes it can be completely calm as well. Uh, but this section, we're going to discuss the why of wind. But first, I want to ask you, why is there wind? I see a couple great answers coming in here associated with the pressure storms as well, uh, the unequal heating of the planet from the equator up to the poles, those are all great answers. But really it's quite complex as to why there are winds, but it's also a bit simple as well. And it's based on Newton's laws of motion. Uh, basically a force will act on uh, air parcels. And if you consider an air parcel just like a little rock or something, a very infinitesimal hot air balloon, for example, a uh, very small pocket of air, uh, it's exposed to certain forces and uh, acceleration of an air parcel, uh, similar to an object, is due to the net forces acting on it. Uh, that came from Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, that's a, a theory uh, that can be applied to weather as well, uh, driving wind. Uh, and in general, there are many different forces that will act on air parcels. One of the most important ones is the pressure gradient force or the PGF. Uh, that very large category five hurricane that I showed you that is Hurricane Michael. That's a very strong low pressure center. And you can see that graphic that I included there with the low pressure right in the middle and all those arrows going toward that low pressure. The wind wants to go from high pressure to low pressure to even out and achieve equilibrium. So basically when you have a low pressure at the surface, you have the weight of the entire atmosphere above you from the troposphere all the way up through the thermosphere. And uh, uh, under certain conditions, uh, when those particles, uh, air particles are located a little bit further apart, a little bit less dense, you get low pressure that forms at the surface. Uh, that can be created from a buckled jet stream as well. Uh, but when you get that low pressure, the wind wants to go from high pressure to low pressure to try to even out that discrepancy in the weight of the atmosphere above it. So initially, uh, if you have an air parcel at rest and then a low pressure develops relatively close to it, that air parcel will start to move toward the low pressure. And the opposite is true with a high pressure. It'll want to move away from the high pressure and toward low pressure. And that's why you get divergent air at the surface. Generally speaking, high pressure associated with uh, sinking air, calm conditions, sunny skies, nice weather. I know some of you said that's your ideal weather when I first started this, this off with that question. Whereas low pressure centers are associated with bad weather. You have winds going in toward the low pressure. They're forced upward and you need lift to generate those clouds to cool the air and to achieve condensation and to develop those cumulonimbus clouds that can often be rotating. And the pressure gradient force can also be applied in the vertical. Uh, the image at the bottom right, that's called hydrostatic balance. Uh, if you guys, if you're interested in throwing that word out at school, you'll definitely be the coolest person in school for sure. Uh, but that's created by the vertical balance of the pressure gradient, which is always pointed upward 
And that's because you have lower pressure relative to your level above you because there are, is less atmosphere above you as you go up above the ground. And that causes that pressure gradient force to be directed from high to low pressure, but it's pointed straight up. And when it perfectly balances the downward directed gravitational force, that's called hydrostatic balance. And in general, a supercell storm or a cumulonimbus cloud will throw the atmosphere temporarily out of hydrostatic balance and you can get extreme updrafts, but that's also caused by a strong low pressure system. The rotating updraft of those supercell storms that we talk so much about, that's a low pressure system as well. So are those tornadoes uh, that, that I chased down so much, those very powerful tornadoes, similar to the one that was just Southeast of Chicago as an EF3. All the wind around those tornadoes wants to blow toward that low pressure to try to help the atmosphere to achieve equilibrium. But the pressure gradient force is just one of those forces that we consider uh, when discussing why wind happens. And there are also other uh, forces that are related to the spinning of the earth. Uh, so uh, naturally the earth continues to spin. And uh, because of that, uh, the Northern hemisphere, uh, once wind starts to move over a sufficiently long distance, it gets deflected off to the right from a ground relative standpoint. So imagine if you're at a merry-go-round spinning around in a circle uh, really rapidly, and then you have somebody that's standing right next to the merry-go-round uh, from a stationary position, and you're spinning around rapidly in a circle, and then you throw a baseball off the merry-go-round. From your rotational perspective, it looks like the baseball is just thrown. But if you're standing right next to it from a stationary perspective, it looks a lot different, and it's deflecting uh, because the Earth is rotating uh, beneath the atmosphere you have to account for that spin in the atmosphere and uh, that force that's directed to the right in the Northern hemisphere uh, gets stronger as you go up in latitude because of that spin. Uh, but basically what happens is an air parcel, that little blue circle there, initially it's at rest until it gets exposed to that pressure gradient force. Then it starts to move away from high pressure toward low pressure. And once it moves a sufficiently far distance, it begins to deflect to the right. That's the green arrow there. That's the Coriolis force, we call it. Uh, that's uh, the force uh, that happens uh, due to the spin of the Earth in the southern hemisphere. It's deflected to the left. And then as that accelerates, you get greater and greater uh, deflection to the right relative to the spinning Earth. And eventually, it starts to perfectly balance the pressure gradient force. And that's called the geostrophic wind. Uh, that's the wind higher up in the atmosphere, uh, void of friction up there. Uh, basically the perfect balance between your pressure gradient force to the left and your Coriolis force to the right. But once that wind starts to curve, we have to factor in yet another force, the centrifugal force. And that's also, imagine if you're spinning around on a merry-go-round, similar to when you threw that baseball, and suddenly you let go of the merry-go-round, you'll fly off. And that theoretical force, uh, the centrifugal force, centripetal acceleration, that's directed outward as well. And so when that happens, you also have to factor in that force. But you have the Coriolis, you have the pressure gradient force, and the centrifugal force when that flow is curved, as is often the case, especially with a tornado and a hurricane, as that wind is circulating in a curved fashion around the tornado. But when a tornado is too small, uh, for example, a tornado is probably on the order of about a mile across, max. And that wind is not traveling enough distance for that spin of the earth to really matter. So a tornado, you just include the pressure gradient force and the centrifugal force. And that's called something uh, called cyclostrophic balance. That's reserved for those most powerful of storms like a tornado or even a hurricane, those really small pinhole eyes that you get in the middle of those category four or category five storms. But the basics of wind, uh, it, it may seem a bit complicated now when you see that air parcel with all those arrows drawn everywhere, but really it's just Newton's laws, the balance of those forces that cause that little hot air balloon to start moving. And as you saw in that global circulation, winds will organize in belts based on the global circulation because the equator uh, is heated unevenly compared to the poles, you get a couple jet streams that will form. The subtropical jet stream forms further south that forms due to different mechanisms in the polar front jet stream off to the north. The polar front jet stream occurs where the temperature gradients are strongest, and that largely impacts our weather here in the United States. You get those massive storm systems that are called troughs. You also have a ridge. Those are associated with higher pressure, nicer weather. The troughs, though, those are associated with stormy conditions. You can see in this map here, uh, we have a trough that is dominating the central US there. Uh, and look at how that flow is curved as well. 
that's why you have to factor in that Coriolis force, with, with force, which wants to deflect it off to the right, the pressure gradient force, which wants to pull that air in toward the trough. Uh, but in general, the weather moves from west to east with that jet stream, uh, which is based on the for force balance that we discussed with low pressure off to the left, the deflection off to the right, that is the Coriolis force, and then that outward directed force also, that is a centrifugal force. And the balance of all those forces uh, that's when wind is a steady state. It'll either keep blowing at the same uh, velocity or it'll remain at rest until that force balance can change. Uh, but this jet stream, the polar front jet stream, is a channel of very strong winds in the upper levels of the, the troposphere. And that's largely what drives our weather uh, here in the United States, whether it be winter or summer. However, in the southern U.S., uh, when you start to get into the subtropics a little bit, you start to get those uh, uh, hurricanes as well coming from east to west, the trade winds. At that point, uh, you start to get impacted more by the tropical systems, by those hurricanes. And hurricanes are actually torn apart uh, by the jet stream because it has so much wind shear and the hurricanes are so sensitive, just feeding off the ocean surface. When you start to get wind shear, it will start to tear apart those storms. So you have very different dynamics for wind when you go from the tropics versus the extra tropics versus the poles. And now for section three, uh, this is the fun part as well, the where and why of not only wild weather, but also nice weather, rainy weather as well. We'll break down across the country where everybody lives here, where some of the worst uh, weather happens and why. But first I wanted to start off with a question. How well can you forecast where in the continental, how well can you forecast American weather? Let's see. A lot of it's uh, based on the jet stream going from west to east. Uh, but first, uh, where in the uh, continental United States do the most tornadoes happen? I see a couple great answers coming in, the Great Plains. I see a couple for the Mid-South. And it may seem like Tornado Alley should get the most tornadoes here in the Great Plains, and it has historically. Uh, but we have seen a couple of changes as well here in recent years. A lot of it could be due to global warming as well, uh, but it does seem to be a bit of a shift from the Great Plains toward the Mid-South. Uh, locations like Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Tennessee are getting a lot of tornadoes earlier in the spring. And it seems like at least the last couple of years at Tornado Alley here in the Great Plains has seen a little bit less uh, in terms of tornadoes. But a lot of why uh, this extreme weather happens across the country is related to that collision of air masses. And here you can see the different tornado alleys that are located across the United States. You might think that just the Great Plains uh, gets a, a majority of the tornadoes, but that's actually not correct. There are other locations uh, in the US and Southern Canada that also get a lot of tornadoes. The Mid-South Alley uh, there in the South Central US uh, gets a ton of tornadoes. And in fact, you can see the map on the right, all those tracks are tracks of violent tornadoes where uh, those darker, darker red and pink colors, those are EF4 and EF5 tornadoes. And notice the abundance of those tornadoes in the Mid-South. A lot of those are recent. Some of those are from 2011 as well. A lot of them from the super outbreak of April 27, 2011. April 15, that same year, we also had over 100 tornadoes from Mississippi to Alabama. And it does seem like the heart of Tornado Alley is shifting from the Great Plains down to portions of the Mid-South. But there are also other locations like east of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, the Carolina Piedmont can get a lot of tornadoes. And really any state across the United States can get tornadoes. But the reason why you get most of them in the Great Plains and the Mid-South is because you often get a collision of those air masses, the maritime tropical air masses coming up from the Southeast, the continental polar air masses coming in from the Northwest, and also the continental tropical air mass coming in from the Mexican Plateau is a very hot, dry air mass that can lead to those dry lines. And this location here in the Great Plains and the Mid-South is one of the few locations anywhere in the world where it happens so common where you get the collision of those very different air masses. And that's why you get so many storm systems, so many tornadoes. That's why everybody travels from across the world just to storm chase in the Great Plains and the Mid-South. More tornadoes happen here than anywhere else in the world. Some other locations though that also get a lot of tornadoes are like Bangladesh, for example, just to the south of the Himalayan Plateau. There's also a tornado alley in South America too, uh, the Pampas of Argentina and the Southern Brazil, where you can also get a lot of tornadoes. And that's because you also get a, a collision of those air masses, the tropical maritime air masses from the North and the Southern hemisphere and those warm dry air masses from the heart of the continent coming in uh, from the North or from the South in the Southern hemisphere. Everything is flip flopped. Uh, from the north to the south, at least in a north-south standpoint from the northern to the southern hemisphere. 
So where in the continental US does the most snow fall? I know some of you mentioned early on that some of your ideal weather is big time snow. I grew up in Michigan where we get major lake effect snow events. That says that cold air, the continental polar air masses pass over those relatively warm waters. That's what I was chasing when I was in Buffalo, New York in 2014 with over nine feet of uh, snow uh, fell there. But where do you think uh, in, the, in the continental US sees the most snow? Got some good answers coming in. Lake effect, those, that's obviously a great answer as well. Mountain locations, that's also an incredibly uh, good answer. But really the answer are those, is those mountain locations. Uh, the key to uh, generating a lot of snow is to have cold air uh, that's below freezing uh, through a deep enough layer to generate snowfall. You also need that moisture. Uh, but not only the mountain locations, uh, you can see a lot of those areas get some of the biggest uh, snow, snowstorms. The biggest snowstorm in a 24 hour period happened in Colorado in the, in the continental US uh, with over 76 inches of snow in a 24 hour period. That map on the right shows by state the biggest snowstorms in a 24 hour period. And it's not surprising that most of those biggest snowstorms happen in mountain locations. And that's because you take those maritime polar air masses that come in off the Pacific, they hit those mountains. And when you go up in elevation, the temperature cools to a level that's cold enough to support snowfall, but you still get that big time moisture streaming off the Pacific uh, with those maritime polar air masses. Other locations though, downwind of the Great Lakes, like Western New York, the Tug Hill Plateau, for example, downwind of Lake Ontario, they average over 200 inches of snow uh, per year there, sometimes even seeing well over 300 inches there in the Tug Hill Plateau. And that's a location that combines that lift in topography with a lot of moisture streaming off the Great Lakes. And you also get a, a, an abundance of very powerfully cold air masses coming in from the north called continental polar air masses that come over that relatively warm body of water and then just dump all that snowfall downstream. You can get snowfall rates of four, five, six inches per hour uh, downwind of, of the Great Lakes. But you can also get snowstorms as well in the Mid-South, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. You may remember this past winter, we had that massive Arctic blast uh, that caused a lot of power outages as well uh, over portions of Oklahoma and Texas. And that cold air mass went all the way down south into the marshes of Louisiana, freezing everything, creating some beautiful scenes. But it is very possible for those continental polar air masses to surge way to the south into the subtropics, uh, basically dominating the entire southern US. So where in the continental, continental US does the most rainfall? We covered uh, where the snow falls in those mountain regions. Obviously those are in the Northern US a bit too, uh, where you get uh, colder temperatures downstream of, uh, of the Great Lakes. But where in the US does the most rainfall? I see some great answers coming in here. Thank you, everybody. A lot of Seattle. Uh, Seattle does get a lot of rain. Uh, definitely uh, gets a lot of rain up in Seattle. Uh, but one reason why the Pacific Northwest maybe doesn't see as much rain as uh, the warmer locations in the US is because cold air is not able to hold as much moisture as warm air. Warm air can hold a lot more moisture. That's why in the summer you get those very heavy rainfall events, sometimes can dump several inches of rain. You get a lot of flooding uh, as well uh, during the warm season. But actually the rainiest place in the entire US is Mobile, Alabama. They get over 66 inches of rain uh, per year on average. A lot of that is also from the maritime tropical air masses and the hurricanes and tropical cyclones that are associated with those. That's when you get those big dumps of rain and it seems like they could be getting a little bit worse with time. Uh, for example, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, those tropical cyclones can stall out and just dump copious amounts of rain. But you can also see a ton of rain in the Pacific Northwest. Seattle gets a little bit less than that, but that Olympic Peninsula, even though there are, uh, is a lack of uh, big cities out there, uh, some of those higher mountains are really able to squeeze out a lot of moisture there off the Pacific. Uh, you get basically an influx of uh, consistent maritime polar air masses coming in uh, from the west uh, to the east. The driest locations that see the least amount of rain, those are the desert locations in the US. Those locations that are dominated by that continental tropical air mass uh, that develops over the Mexican plateau and can surge north, just a drift north, I should say, 
this time of year. And when you get those really hot temperatures in the desert southwest that go well into the triple digits, that can also excite uh, monsoon conditions. So later on in the summer, you can get heavy rain producing storms that can produce dust storms and debris flows uh, in the desert southwest. Those locations are dry on average, but there are certain times in the year where you can get quite a bit of precipitation there, lightning storms, and certainly can get extreme weather. So where in the US has the most perfect weather? I know this is kind of a subjective question uh, because the perfect weather for me is a lot different uh, than my neighbor, for example, who, who likes to golf and that needs to have more sunny conditions, more calm weather uh, for me. Uh, I prefer supercell storms, baseball sized hail blowing out my windshield. Some people though, uh, are, are fearful of severe weather and don't like it as much. And that's why we issue those warnings and try to better understand uh, severe weather. But from a mainstream perspective, where in the United States has the most perfect, sunny, calm, non-stormy weather? Great questions. Everybody here is incredibly sharp. And yes, the sunniest locations are definitely in the desert Southwest, but just because it's sunny doesn't mean that it's necessarily perfect. And it gets extremely hot in locations in interior Southern California, uh, also Arizona, those desert locations, temperatures well into the triple digits, Death Valley uh, there in, a, a south, in the Southeastern California, the interior location gets incredibly hot. That's the hottest location anywhere in the US. And even though it's really sunny, that weather is not ideal uh, for us to be outside. In fact, it could even be deadly if you're outside for too long without water in the desert. But the periphery of those locations where it can be just a little bit cooler and you still get those sunny skies, for example, the Texas Panhandle up to Eastern Colorado, those locations in Southern California that are on the fringes of that continental tropical air mass, but also get some moderation from the cold ocean current on the Pacific Ocean side. You get a cold ocean current on the Pacific, you get a warm ocean current on the Atlantic side, and that cold current from North to South on the California side can have a moderating effect. And that's why San Diego uh, wins as the, uh, the city with the nicest weather. I'd be pretty bored personally in San Diego, unless I went inland a little bit uh, to cover that monsoon. But if you like nice weather, that's relatively moderate in temperature. San Diego is one of the sunniest, nicest places anywhere in the US. What extreme weather happens near you where you live? I know everybody gets extremes. Even San Diego, those locations that are known as some of the nicest locations to live anywhere, it gets incredibly extreme weather. And in fact, we're coming up on the wildfire season. Uh, even here in Colorado, I'm seeing a lot of smoke uh, in, in the skies as well. So even those locations that are relatively nice, you still get a lot of extreme weather, but everybody's different across the US. Whether you live in the Southeast or uh, the Gulf Coast where you might experience hurricanes, you're constantly watching the tropical updates this time of year. Whether you live in Tornado Alley uh, or the Mid-South, it all depends on what time of year as well uh, when extreme weather. But I see all different kinds of answers coming in. Lots of tornadoes, of course. I know that those are fresh on our mind as we are right in the heart of severe weather season. But this is a map that shows the billion dollar weather and climate disasters from 2020. Uh, some things that stand out. One of the worst natural disasters was a derecho event on August 10. Uh, that was in Iowa last year. And that produced winds on the order of a category four hurricane up there. Uh, winds that are equivalent to a tornado, widespread damage, uh, corn crops were taken out there uh, from that derecho. And it's that time of year, this time of year when the upper Midwest gets those really long lived squall line events that can move across many states uh, with several hundreds if not thousands of severe wind reports. That's called a derecho, a very long lived squall line. You can see along the Southern US and the coastlines, that's when you get uh, the influx of those tropical cyclones, hurricanes, tropical storms, depressions, subtropical storms as well. Those will dump copious amounts of rainfall, flooding rainfall. Uh, that's uh, one of the biggest problems uh, with those hurricanes in addition to the storm surge as they'll take that the body of water, pile it up against the coastline, especially just east of the eye. But last year we had a record breaking hurricane season. Uh, many of those uh, hurricanes also hit the coastline of Louisiana. Uh, it seems like we're having an early start uh, to that tropical season once again this year. Uh, with the La Nina starting to expand in the Pacific Ocean. That's the opposite of El Nino. When you get cold water in the tropical Pacific, that leads to less wind shear on the Atlantic side and you get a very active hurricane season often depending on other variables. 
And look at those wildfires across the West, including here in Colorado. Uh, we had the Cal Wood Fire just to the north of Boulder that caused so much damage up there uh, with the drought conditions dominating the western U.S. there. We've just had too much continental tropical air masses uh, dominating, especially during the summer months. Not enough snow in those mountain locations during the winter, and that's contributed to drought and the abundance of wildfires that are already starting out there in the western U.S., and once the monsoon starts in the southwestern U.S., all of those old fire areas or burn scars, when heavy rain falls on that, you get major debris flows, flash floods. So it's only a matter of time once this active monsoon season starts in the southwestern U.S. And we're going to start to get uh, that flooding, those debris flows coming out of the mountains as well. Uh, it's equally as dangerous. And those locations are known for their nice weather uh, for the most part. But every different location across the U.S., even those with historically climatologically nice weather are capable of having very extreme weather as well. Which of these terms is not real? You've got A, bomb cyclone, B, thunder snow, C, polar vortex, and D, of course, the shark NATO. If I told you that I intercepted a shark NATO, I'd definitely be lying. Uh, tornadoes are capable of, uh, there have been stories in the past of fish and certain wildlife. Uh, I've even personally seen a cow uh, get lofted by a tornado uh, in uh, southeastern Wyoming. But yep, you got your, everybody is right here. Sharknado is uh, not a real term, at least yet. I haven't seen any verification of a, a tornado or a hurricane lofting a shark through the air as we saw in that, uh, that, that movie, that comedy, uh, Sharknado. Uh, I have seen a cow get lofted by a tornado. That was depicted in the movie Twister. That actually happens uh, where you get land animals and a, a tornado that's strong enough and cattle will get trapped inside of a farmer's fence. Uh, that's definitely a problem. But for the most part, cattle are pretty good at, uh, at knowing if there's a tornado coming. And I've even seen a whole entire herd point their rear into the wind instinctively uh, just to add an extra layer of protection when it does get windy and when you get those severe storms that are impacting cattle. Uh, they're actually really good at avoiding those storms. But the Sharknado is that term that is not real out of all those four. But a bomb cyclone, that's explosive cyclogenesis, a very intense low pressure system. We discussed how pressure gradient force uh, will want to drive wind from high to low pressure. When you get a bomb cyclone, that's like a low pressure center on steroids. Uh, that low pressure center, uh, that, that low pressure is dropping at a rate of 24 millibars over a 24 hour period, rapid intensification. Your pressure gradient force goes through the roof, causes the wind to spin even faster around that bomb cyclone, and it can create extreme weather conditions. This is a, in Salem, Massachusetts, when I was covering the nor'easter section of that bomb cyclone, and the wind was so strong around that strong low pressure system that it piled up all these ice chunks, causing them to break, and they were coming up onto the shore, almost like a hurricane-like storm surge. Bomb cyclone, cyclogenesis can also uh, apply to hurricanes, rapid intensification of hurricanes, uh, rapid intensification, for example, uh, like Hurricane Wilma, uh, that had a pinhole eye that was only two miles wide, and that one dropped at a rate much stronger uh, than the 24 millibar drop in 24 hours. Uh, but that creates a very strong pressure gradient force, and that's why you get very strong winds associated with bomb cyclones. Thunder snow, a personal favorite of mine. Playing this video, some of the audio gets a little bit intense as I'm celebrating seeing snow hitting me in the face, uh, lightning illuminating the whole entire sky. So thunder snow happens when the temperature is cold enough to support snow, but you also get instability such that a thunderstorm moves into that cold air. And as you know, thunderstorms produce very heavy rain as well. That's when you get flash flooding, when a very slow moving thunderstorm drops copious amounts of rain. But when those thunderstorms move into a cold air mass that's supportive of snow, you get extreme snowfall rates. So you not only are seeing the whole sky illuminate, the thunder sounds weird because of the falling snow, uh, creates a very weird sound effect, kind of a low rumble. Uh, this was an atmospheric river event that I was covering in Mammoth Mountain, California, uh, in the Sierra Nevadas, one of those locations on that snowfall map that gets more snow than most locations across the U.S., 
And that's because you have cold air and moisture streaming off the Pacific and instability. So you get a ton of thunder snow there in the Sierra Nevadas and all the way up to the Cascades in the Mountain West. You also get a lot of thunder snow with lake effect events. And that's because the Great Lakes are so warm. When you get that cold continent, continental polar air mass coming over top that warm water, it creates instability and you get little thunderstorms that will develop off the Great Lakes. And that's why you get thunder snow a lot of times, like when I was covering that Buffalo Lake Effect snow emergency in 2014 with over nine feet of snow and snowfall rates in excess of five inches per hour, thunder or lightning illuminating the whole entire sky. I know Jim Cantore is a big fan of thunder snow as well. Uh, there is nothing more exhilarating when you're covering a winter storm than to see thunder snow because you know things are getting serious. And now the polar vortex. This is a term that's often thrown around uh, when you're watching the news. Sometimes it might be uh, to scare uh, people or to generate views as well when it happens. But these polar vortices are associated with massive outbreaks of continental polar air from the North Pole. Uh, they can also happen from the South Pole, but we know about the polar vortex. Uh, basically, it's a vortex that circulates around the globe during winter. Uh, where it also has a lot of cold air associated with it. So when that jet stream, the polar front jet stream, as we saw, starts to get buckly, when the wind begins to slow down, you get big ridges, big troughs and that, that can lead to a big break of the polar vortex and that cold blob of air will surge from north to south into the US and it can be associated with major lake effect snow. This is actually footage of the Buffalo Lake effect snow emergency there with just crippling snowfall in excess of six inches per hour over a four day period. Even the Dominator vehicle was completely immobilized by that snow, uh, but that was related to a polar vortex event where you get very cold air that's also spinning cyclonically. So it's associated with lift as well. And when that polar vortex moves over the relatively warm bodies of water that are the Great Lakes, it just dumps prolific amounts of snow. Uh, I just remember being in heaven, seeing this snow hitting me in the face, massive flakes, uh, but it can also be extremely impactful, these polar vortices. And locations in the south, when that polar vortex surges all the way down to the su southern latitudes, uh, it can also have big time impacts on the energy uh, sector. For example, Texas and Oklahoma recently had unprecedented cold with that polar vortex and uh, had to have brownouts, had to have people uh, conserve energy there as well. And the same thing can happen when you get heat waves, but a polar vortex is a wintertime phenomenon that's associated with very cold temperatures, major impacts, big time snow downwind of the Great Lakes uh, and other, other things as well. But that's when you get the polar vortex breaking off and that chunk of cold air dives down into the US. Well, Reed, that's the way it is. That was uh, that was pretty impressive, man. Thank you so much. My my question is, we talked about all kinds of events that dump water, maybe in the you know in, in the way of rain or thunderstorms or thunder snow and all those kind of things. I don't think we took you here, saw you take a sip of water and you were talking about weather fast for forty five minutes straight. So that's uh, that in and of itself is a force of nature. So um, thanks so much, Reed. Thanks to all of you out there for some amazing questions. This was uh, definitely one of the more active groups we've ever seen maybe a supercell class if, uh, if I'm not screwing up the terminology too much uh, we promised you guys a couple things we may go over time a little bit to answer some of your questions so maybe if it's got a little bit of time um, make sure you stick around for a few more minutes first thing we're going to do though is we promised everybody an opportunity to take a picture with Reed and in doing so uh, be able to enter you know put that on Instagram and enter to win a, a, a spot in uh, Weather Wonders camp this summer so get those camera nearby um, we'll uh, we'll get put it full screen on Reed here and, and just a second but get those cameras out if you want to learn more about uh, weather wonders camp there's a link on your screen to uh, to be able to learn a little bit more but uh, i think you've got those cameras read let me turn it back to you and now uh, we'll get those pictures never stop chasing everybody And we just to make sure we're using Zoom for this, just to make sure people aren't getting a picture with me. Uh, tell them to say cheese or something. Let's uh, let's uh, let's talk it up, and that way the active speaker definitely goes on you. All right, say cheese, everybody. We can even do an action shot. Pretend you're pointing at an F5 tornado off in the distance. This is kind of my the pose that I'm used to when I'm pointing at a tornado or pointing at a sub vortex or a supercell storm. Make a real intense face as well. 
And we can also do a nice one too, if you'd like a, a nice photo. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's awesome, awesome, man. Thank you so much. That's, uh, I think we actually got good pictures there. I was getting nervous when, uh, you know, everybody gets excited to see you. So um, thank you for that. And the action shot was totally worth it. Uh, some amazing questions coming from all of you guys. We're actually going to invite a, a handful of uh, folks from uh, the Weather Wonders Camp to ask you some on air so you get to, to interact with everybody. While we're getting them queued up, one of my favorite ones that, uh, that someone asked, let me make sure I get the, the order of uh, operations here, right? Uh, what is it that makes cold hair cold air heavier than warm air. So we talked about that as being kind of a big cause of pressure systems and all those kind of things. Why is it that way? Well, cold air, the uh, air molecules are more tightly packed. Uh, they're not moving as fast. They're located closer together, um, almost closer to a solid even, uh, the cold air. But because it's more dense as well, uh, because the weight is heavier, uh, because of that density, that causes it to slide underneath warm air. But the opposite is true with warm air. Those molecules are further apart. The air density is lower as well. Warm air rises, cold air sinks. And that's why, because of the density difference, and really it's because of cold air, those air molecules are tightly packed, whereas warm air, they're a bit further out. They can move a little bit faster, bump against each other, warmer air. So that's why you have cold air being heavier than the warm air. Great question. Yeah, really good question. Thanks so much for uh, for whoever asked that one, and, uh, and and just an amazing answer there too. That one, you kind of you know you hear these these. This is why it happens that way, and there's always a why beyond that, which I guess is what makes uh, you know learning about you know weather and science and everything one so important, but uh, you know, but two so time consuming, right? So uh, so that's perfect. Um, and I'm just looking at my list here. A couple other uh, really good ones. Um, Timothy asked. I thought a really great one. How do floods happen? You know, isn't it? We kind of, you know, we sort of know the earth, earth's looking for equilibrium and, and, you know, we're used to water and all those kind of things. Where do floods come from? In general, floods happen when the rainfall rates are so strong that the hydrological cycle is overwhelmed. And uh, basically when the rain falls, the water will dissipate through runoff flowing into local uh, rivers and lakes, uh, streams. They can also get absorbed into the soil. But each location is different. Some areas will flood more easily than others. Some areas have clay soil that has a lot less space uh, in between uh, the soil particles to absorb water. Sand though in desert locations has a lot of space between the particles. So it does require uh, a, a little bit more water sometimes when you get those sandy loam types of soils. Uh, but for example, a desert uh, where the bedrock's a little bit higher, it can absorb that water right away. Uh, so it really doesn't take as much rain out there to cause flooding problems. Uh, but over uh, the south central U.S., for example, Mobile, the rainiest location in the U.S., requires a lot more rain uh, to get flooding conditions. And that's because the hydrological cycle is set up to evacuate that rain, to allow it to flow into the ocean, to area rivers and streams. And there's a lot more storage uh, potential as well uh, within the soil. So it's actually a pretty complicated uh, process that, that leads to flooding. But in general, it's when those rainfall rates are so strong that the local absorption and runoff can't keep up with it and it causes the water to pile up. And you know the saying, turn around, don't drown. You don't wanna drive through any water because you don't know how deep it is. And it only takes about six inches of flowing water to move a vehicle. So if you ever do see that flooding, don't try to drive through it. Good advice. Good advice. Thank you. I've, I've uh, been, been around those, those debris flows before and seen it. It flows fast. And so um, I'll, I'll take that uh, advice to heart as well. Uh, we've got Travi here. has got a great question. One of our Weather Wonders campers. Uh, we wanted to invite her on screen to, uh, to ask it. So Travi, grab the microphone. Let's go. Um, I have a question about, so is global warming related to weather? And another question is, why do thunderstorms mostly happen in the afternoon time? Those are incredible questions. And it definitely shows that you already have a deep understanding of, of weather. And uh, there is a difference between weather and climate. Weather is what you see that happens day to day. Those are storms that will happen on a day to day basis. Whereas climate is a long term average of those days, whether you're averaging it over a month or over a season or over decades or even longer than that. 
And uh, that's where global warming will happen. That's the, the gradual increase in temperature across the globe, but they definitely are interrelated. Uh, certain extreme weather changes under global warming. As global warming is happening, it disrupts uh, those wind patterns that we talked about, uh, the trade winds, uh, the transport of heat from the poles aloft. It can disrupt even ocean currents as well. And that also impacts extreme weather. So it can impact what you see day to day, every day, if you do see a very powerful hurricane, it's difficult to say that that individual storm happened because of global warming. But when you look at the long-term average of the severity of those storms, for example, tropical cyclones, it seems like global warming might even be uh, having a dampening effect or decreasing the number of tornadoes that happen, at least in the Great Plains. That's another impact of climate change on weather. But there certainly is a relationship between that short day-to-day the atmospheric conditions that you see every day and weather and the long-term average of those over time that is climate. And your other question is why thunderstorms happen during the day during peak heating. That's an incredible question and somebody asked me just recently uh, why don't tornadoes happen very often in the morning? Why do they happen during what we call the magic hour which is late afternoon uh, basically after about 6 p.m. And during the day, when you get the sun to come out, it warms up the surface of the earth and gradually that temperature warms up until it hit, hit, hits uh, peak heating in the mid to late portion of the afternoon. And uh, thunderstorms feed off of hot temperatures, warm temperatures at the ground and a lot of moisture. And so once uh, the heating of the day happens and it warms up those surface temperatures, it increases what we call instability and when that happens, then you'll get the development of these very tall storms that develop in the atmosphere. When you have hot temperatures at the ground, cold temperatures above, that will cause your individual hot air balloons to rise a lot faster. And that's why you get thunderstorms that develop with the heating of the day because you get those warm surface temperatures in combination with uh, deep moisture. Thank you for that. I've been fascinated by that question myself too, with uh, with both uh, you know tornadoes and thunderstorms. So, Shavi, thank you so much for asking that. We got one more on air question coming up here, um, Carter. I think you had an amazing question. We want to give you the chance to do it. So let's uh, let's get you off mute and uh, talk to Reed. Okay, buddy. Hi, Carter. I have a question, but first I'll show you my cool. Storm Chaser short. Whoa, that is awesome. Future Storm Chaser with a tornado on it too. That is cool. A lot cooler than my shirt. I've got a tornado on mine too, see? Yeah. <laughs> that is the coolest shirt I've ever seen. That is awesome, Carter. Yeah, mine has a bigger tornado than yours does. <laughs> it does. A lot of, I'd rather chase that tornado than this little one. Uh, my question is, how do I be a tornado chaser? Well, the key, you have a lot of passion for storms already, I can tell. You remind me of when I was your age, additionally. Uh, originally, I was scared to death of thunder and lightning when I was really little, but then I was obsessed with it. I was interested in weather. And the key is that once you get your driver's license, then you don't have to wait for storms to come to you anymore, but you can drive after them. But it's not necessarily safe uh, when you first get your driver's license. You'll have to go with your parents. Uh, your mom or dad will take you storm chasing maybe once that happens. Uh, but you need to learn a lot about meteorology as well. Uh, attending classes like this, uh, attending the camp, the Weather Wonders Camp is a great first start toward you becoming a storm chaser and an incredible meteorologist. Uh, but just keep learning, keep watching storm chasing videos online. And then once you can drive, I'll be seeing you out there next to a tornado. You can understand what supercells look like, where the tornado is supposed to happen. You can learn how to forecast them once you learn which direction the wind is blowing. And, and then you can, uh, once you can drive and you get a group of storm chasers and you can drive out there and see the storms with your own eyes yourself, do science. And uh, maybe when you're my age, you'll be flying a drone or a remote controlled airplane into the tornadoes. I think that's the future of storm chasing. And you're the generation that's gonna take our field to the next level. And also I have something to say. Uh, maybe I could have a remote control Batmobile that had tornadoes <laughs> on it. Oh, that would be awesome. Yes, the remote control Batmobile put tornadoes all around it too when you're intercepting tornadoes. That would be cool. Almost like the Dominator except remote controlled and it can handle even stronger tornadoes. 
that is an amazing idea. I don't know how you didn't come up with that one yet, Reed. We, um, hey, we're going over time. We got a couple more questions. All you at home too, please keep asking those. I think we got time for at least two more. Um, and so let's get to uh, to one more from uh, from the, the Weather Wonder Screw. I think Anshana is, uh, is on deck here with a, a question for Reed. I think you're on. Let's get you off mute and uh, we'll get your question answered. Hi, Anshana. So how risky is it to be a storm chaser? Well, storm chasing is actually very safe. Uh, the most dangerous part of storm chasing is driving. Uh, but when you know where, where the tornado is happening, when you understand uh, the tornado and where you can forecast where it's going to move, then it's very safe and you can stay out of the dangerous area. Uh, so overall, storm chasing is safe. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you didn't attend the Weather Wonders camp, for example, and just try to go out there and storm chase, you could definitely get in trouble because those storms can be a little bit dangerous. But overall, Storm chasing is actually very safe. And it's because people like you uh, learn to storm chase years down the line and you understand the storms, you understand meteorology and overall uh, storm chasing is, is actually very safe. Great question. Yeah, really great question and, and a great answer. I think that's uh, that's probably a good place for us to end it because we went a little over time. We got, we got some bedtimes coming up, some dinner times coming up and everything um, all across the country. Um, great advice, though. It's, it's all about, you know, knowledge is power. So if you know what the where the dangers are coming from and why, you can build yourself a Dominator vehicle or a, uh, a remote control Batmobile if, uh, if you'd like and, uh, and be ready for it. So um, really great advice. Hey, any last words, Reed? I know you're going to be back later this summer. Uh, you're going to be back quite a few times. So um, this, uh, this isn't goodbye. It's just see you later. Um, so uh, any, any parting thoughts for today? Well, that's right. We're just getting started. And I look forward to our future classes. We're going to be talking all things hurricanes and tropical cyclones as well, just in time for the hurricane season. But what I wanted to say to everybody here is when I say never stop chasing, it doesn't necessarily mean storms, but the key is just to do what you love for a living. Do what you're passionate about uh, all aspects of science or any other field as well. If you do what you love for a living, then you never work a day in your life. And it's really easy to work very hard at it. And I know there's a lot of severe weather enthusiasts here and those interested in meteorology and storm chasing. And if you're excited about it and you love doing it, uh, the sky is the limit. And uh, so it's just important to uh, do what you love for a living, stay passionate. And uh, you guys are making me excited just talking about weather here. Uh, but Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you about the whys of weather, and I look forward to additional classes here at Varsity Tutors. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Reed. Yeah, the sky is the limit. I think even above the troposphere, if, uh, if I remember that right. So um, thanks to all of you for all of your amazing questions. We're so excited to go check out your uh, your photos on Instagram, which uh, which leads me to, I want to make sure you guys know exactly uh, who to tag and uh, and when to do it. So here are those instructions there. If you get those up, uh, you'll be entered to win a spot in Weather Wonders Camp. We've got a new one starting every Monday. If you're interested in learning more, um, click the link on your screen. Um, there are some pretty cool activities. Um, kind of directed by Reed in there, some uh, some cool lessons, hands-on weather activities and all those kinds of things. If you want to check some out, join Weather Wonders Camp or just go into the uh, the free Varsity Tutors Learning Lab to see some of those activities there. And uh, so while you wait for uh, for the next one of these classes, you don't have to stop chasing. Plenty more fun where that came from. So, uh, so huge thanks to everyone. Thanks to the Weather Wonders campers in the live studio audience. And we'll, uh, we'll see everybody back here again soon.